All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the um, Home ARP Referral Methods uh, Clinic. My name is Andalyn Nesbitt Rodriguez. I'm with ICF, and I'm joined today by my colleague Jessica Lurs from Aptit Associates. Um, and we're we're going to be your presenters for today. So this presentation assumes that you as the audience are in one of two places. Either you're trying to better understand what a referral method is, um, and or you're trying to figure out what needs to be done to implement referral methods. Today, we're going to give an overview of HOMARP referral methods. Uh, we're going to quickly explain what they are and uh, why they're required. We're also going to review preferences and limitations in the context of using a referral method to implement them. The bulk of this presentation uh, is going to be used to demonstrate referral methods in action. We're going to walk through steps and um, actions that PJs are going to need to take in order to um, in, at the implementation stage, which is where you are now um, to provide and we're going to provide some examples to demonstrate how a certain referral method will work. So, before we get started, we have a quick poll. Uh, the poll question should pop up on your screen in just a moment. Um, and this poll is about where you are in the implementation of uh, in the process of implement implementing referral methods. So have you selected your referral methods based on your consultation feedback that you did during that allocation planning process, but have not really had any additional conversations regarding implementation? Um, have you already de developed some policies and procedures with partnerships um, in partnership with key stakeholders around those referral methods and how those are going to work? Have you drafted written agreements um, and that outline the PJ preferences and referral methods? Um, or are you really far along? Have you already begun selecting uh, tenants and clients uh, using referral methods? Kind of just give us an idea of who's in the room and where everybody's at um, with where you're at so far in the process. Remember to hit submit on that poll. It looks like a lot of folks haven't answered yet. Um, so we just want to make sure that we kind of get an idea. And it looks so far like a lot of folks are at the very beginning. Um, you've selected some referral methods based on consultation feedback, but have not yet had those additional conversations regarding implementation. And that is fine. That's one reason that we're here today. We're going to go through a lot of information that hopefully will be um, of help to you as you move through the different steps here. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and thank you for your responses. All right, and we will move forward. Okay. So now I'm going to give um, an overview of referral methods, and then uh, later on, we're going to get into some real life examples. So a uh, referral methods, a home ARP referral method is the process to administer home ARP assistance to QPs or qualifying populations. Um, PG, as a PJ, you'll choose the appropriate referral method to administer home ARP assistance to qualifying individuals and families. PJs must provide home ARP access to all qualifying populations. Access in this context specifically means the ability to apply for or be referred to home art projects. The referral method is a process to ensure that housing assistance uh, to ensure housing assistance to all eligible QPs, qualifying populations. Referral methods connect eligible QP households um, to home art projects or activities. So that is what a referral method does. It connects eligible QPs to the home art project or activities. As a PJ, remember that a referral method is uh, how someone who is eligible accesses projects and activities that you create with home art funding. So be thoughtful when selecting a referral method for home art activities or projects and consider which method is going to ensure access for all QPs throughout the life of the project. So for TBRA um, and um, supportive services, um, that would be for the life of the project. For home ARP um, rental housing and non-congregate shelter, we're talking about the life of the home ARP compliance period. So 
again, remember that HOMARP is intended to serve all QPs identified in that HOMARP implementation notice. If you um, don't have it readily available, it's CPD-21-10. That is the HOMARP implementation notice, and that spells out the QPs. Um, HOMARP is new, but it's based on the HOME program. Um, one area of the HOME statute that's particularly important to understand for Home ARP is Part A, Subchapter 2, which requires the use of a waiting list to select participants. A Home ARP referral method serves as the method by which you organize all the QPs and connect them with the Home ARP projects. So referral methods are helpful to PJs um, in a few different ways. Um, Home ARP referral methods uh, ensure eligible qualifying populations have, um, oops, I apologize. Uh, have access to your home art program um, by affirmatively marketing your program or project to all qualifying populations. Referral methods also serve to create a standard process for prioritizing qualifying households according to the PJ's preferences and any established methods of prioritization. We're going to go over that in just a little bit as well. To ensure that the best referral method option is used for each activity or project undertaken, PJs have the option to use different methods for different activities or projects. So this is why you'll want to think about uh, the referral methods, um, how they're going to connect the qualifying households and the type of activity or project you're undertaking. So for example, a waiting list may work well for rental housing, but it might not work as efficiently for a non-congregate shelter. Households seeking non-congregate shelter are likely in need of immediate an immediate solution, um, and the standard uh, waiting list might um, not be as effective for providing that immediate solution. So it's important that PJs take into consideration your local needs and resources when you're choosing your referral method. Referral methods may uh, collect documentation to support QP eligibility. Uh, this is the determination uh, that the PJ is going to need to make with the partners, depending on the referral method chosen for you. So depending on the referral method, different documentation is going to be needed to support that qualifying population eligibility. Documentation is required to be collected at the project level. If the referral method is centralized, a PJ may institute an agreement that the entity collecting that documentation is going to share that information with the project or activity. Um, in such cases, the PJ is going to need to clearly define roles, make it clear who the entity um, may provide documentation to, so basically make it clear through the written agreement that the entity may provide documentation to the project or activity. Um, the PJ is also going to need to institute policies and procedures to protect PII, or personally identifiable information. So the final two bullets here on this screen are reminders. Um, the PJ must use a Home ARP approved referral method and must monitor that referral method throughout the life of the Home ARP project or the um, compliance period when, it, when you're talking about rental housing or non-congregate shelter. If the referral method you've chosen isn't working, please know that you can change it. Uh, the approved referral method must be incorporated into the written agreement with the PJ partners, um, but the agreements can be updated if needed. A referral method that's used today might not might prove less effective um, three years from now. As a part of the monitoring, PJs are going to want to regularly assess how effective the chosen referral method is at affirmatively marketing that project or activity, how um, effective that referral method is at adhering to the preferences that are established by the PJ, and how effective that referral method is at generally connecting qualifying households to home art projects or activities. There are two guides on the HUD exchange um, that are very useful here. Um, one is an introduction to home ARP referral methods and coordinated entry, and the second is using home ARP referral methods. So let's talk about the three referral method options. Uh, home ARP, there's home ARP expanded coordinated entry, that's one. There's coordinated entry and other referral methods. And there's also a project or activity waiting list. And we're going to go through each of these. So if you have identified preferences, um, you can use any of these three options. But if no preferences are identified, then option number three, the project or activity waiting list, is your only option. So a few notes about each. Uh, for Home ARP Expanded Coordinated Entry, 
Notice the name. We specifically refer to this option as Home ARP Expanded Coordinated Entry because this option requires the existing continuum, continuum of care coordinated entry to expand to accept all Home ARP QPs. So that means that the community uh, continuum of care agrees to adopt the Home ARP preferences and prioritization methods established by the PJ. So in other words, the continuum of care will change their coordinated entry system. It also means that the coordinated entry is incorporating the use of home art definitions. And this is really important. Um, for example, when referring to homeless households, coordinated entry would be using the home art definition for homeless. So that's QP1, um, which is only paragraphs one through three of the McKinney Vento definition. So that's a change from the, the regular definitions that we typically use. Um, it's only paragraphs one through three. Home ARP expanded coordinated entry means that the only method used to connect qualifying households with your project or activity is by direct referral from coordinated entry. Coordinated entry acts as a centralized source of collecting applications from qualifying populations. It organizes the applications according to PJ preferences and it makes referrals to the project or activity. The project or activity does not accept referrals from anywhere else. So this option requires thoughtful consideration and a really strong partnership between the PJ and the continuum of care. Option two um, is uh, coordinated entry um, with other referral methods. Um, so coordinated entry is going to be used to connect households that are already in the coordinated entry um, system who also meet the QP criteria with your project or activity. So with this option, coordinated entry does not expand or change in any way. And it doesn't make direct referrals into a project or activity. Other referral methods means referrals from other agencies, self-referrals, or project um, or activity specific waiting lists. So by combining the referrals from coordinated entries and the other referral sources, those referrals from other agencies, self-referrals, or, or the waiting list, PJs are ensuring that all qualifying populations have access. There would uh, be a list that coordinated entry and the other sources are making referrals to, and that list could be managed by the third party, for example, by 211, um, or uh, by a specific project um, or activity. That list is organized according to preferences and priorities um, identified by the PJ. Okay, so that's option two. Option three is that project or activity uh, waiting list. This is the default referral method that most PJs are going to be familiar with. Um, this is managed the same way that a home waiting list would be. It can be used with preferences and limitations, but it is, again, the only option if no preferences are identified. So uh, please note that there is a list involved with each of these options. The difference is where they sit and how they operate. Choosing home ARP coordinated entry or coordinated entry with other uh, referral methods doesn't erase the fact that there's a list of applicants somewhere. With expanded coordinated entry, your list lives with coordinated entry and it's dynamic. With coordinated entry and other referral methods, the list could live in a centralized location or it could live with the project or activity. Either way, all referrals go onto the list, which is then organized by the PJ's preference. All right, so let's back up just a little bit and talk about those home ARP QPs, qualifying populations. This is a quick review. So referral methods are intended to connect qualifying populations to PJ's home ARP projects or activities. Um, so reviewing those uh, QP definitions, this is who referral methods are connecting to the projects. Um, you can also refer to past trainings for additional guidance and information specifically around qualifying populations or QPs. Um, so, the qualifying populations are um, QP1, homeless, that's as defined in 24 CFR Part 91.5, that's ho the homeless definition, and remember, again, it's just paragraphs 1, 2, and 3, not that fourth paragraph. Um, at risk of homelessness is defined in 24 CFR uh, Part 91.5. Uh, QP3 is domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, um, fleeing or attempting to flee, domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, assault, stalking, or human trafficking. 
And QP4 is um, other populations who don't qualify under any of the populations above, but are either uh, families requiring or households requiring services or housing assistance to present to prevent homelessness, or could be those uh, who are at greatest risk of housing instability. The point of home art referral methods to, is to ensure that all QPs have access to your overall home art program. And remember that access means they can apply for your home art project or activity. Does not necessarily mean that um, everyone or that all QPs will end up receiving services. All right, so a quick review of preferences. I promised earlier we go through preferences and limitations just a little bit. Um, I know I said this earlier, but I uh, want to remind you again, any limitation or preference uh, must not violate non-discrimination requirements. That was on a, an earlier slide. Um, check in with the Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity Office if you have any questions. Your HUD rep should be able to connect you if you're unable to connect with them. All right, so preferences. Preferences allow one qualifying household to be referred before another, thereby establishing an order that different households are referred to an activity or project. So allows one qualifying household to be referred before another, thereby establishing the order that different households are referred to an activity or project. Um, preferences provide priority to a specific QP or subpopulation. An example of a preference, um, a QP preference would be QP1. An example of a subpopulation within that QP might be veterans, um, veterans across all QPs. All right, so let's talk about methods of prioritization. If a PJ has a preference, then a method of prioritization determines who gets referred first. So, for example, if a PJ has a preference for QP1, for the homeless population, then an example of a method of prioritization could be the length of time that they were homeless. So everyone who meets QP1 criteria goes to the top of the list, and then they're organized according to how long they've been homeless. If no method of prioritization is identified, then the default is the chronological order. So everyone who meets the QP1 criteria would go to the top of the list, and then um, they would be sorted in the order that their application was received. All right, so limitations. Um, limitations affect uh, the access provided by the referral method. So this limits access to selected QPs or subpopulations of QPs. Um, this doesn't dictate which referral method can be used, but does exclude certain QPs or subpopulations from eligibility for a project or activity. All right, affirmative marketing. Affirmative marketing uh, requirements uh, can be found at 24 CFR part 92.351. Um, and affirmative marketing um, requirements apply to all supportive services or TBRA, tenant-based rental assistance activities. It also refers to rental housing and non-congregate shelter projects with five or more home art funded units. Requirements include developing procedures that identify the method used to inform the public about the PJ's affirmative marketing policy, um, includes uh, compliance requirements for subrecipients and for owners, uh, practices to inform and solicit applications from all QPs, um, affirmative marketing at the overall program level um, and the project activity level, um, there should be home art program level affirmative marketing procedures, and there should also be activity or project level affirmative marketing plans, uh, which will set forth how outreach will be implemented for each QP um, and for any preferences or limitations that are identified. Lastly, um, affirmative marketing requirements include outreach specific to QPs and the established preferences and limitations. Um, identify roles in your written agreements to ensure appropriate parties, uh, records, document affirmative marketing efforts and outcomes. That's very important. That should all be in the written agreement. All right, so what actions are going to be taken and who's responsible? Um, note that the affirmative marketing includes actionable steps to inform and attract eligible participants in the housing market area. So that's irrespective of demographic characteristics, including protected classes. Um, this applies even when tenant eligibility limitations or preferences exist uh, per the written agreement between the PJ and the project owner. But within that context, 
um, PJs um, and referral method partners should be clear about roles, including who will take action to ensure outreach is conducted to different home ARP QPs and to ensure that affirmative marketing requirements are met. So this includes conversations between the PJ and the referral method partners um, to determine what outreach methods will be used. Um, remember, different methods may be needed for different qualifying populations. Um, the conversations will include determining the coordinated entry system um, has an extensive existing structure in place, ensuring that the coordinated entry system has an existing um, extensive existing structure in place to identify households who meet the QP1 criteria, that homeless criteria, um, to ensure that local 211 or 211 systems may also have existing structure to target households that are in QP2 through QP4 um, and QP4 um, populations. So that's the at risk of homeless, homeless populations and the other populations. Um, victim services providers know how to reach households in QP3. So those are um, those populations that are fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, sexual assault, and sex trafficking. So in that way, that's just kind of an example of how different uh, partners may have that outreach um, that you need to reach the different QPs. PJs and referral method partners should also discuss how the applications will be made accessible to all QPs. So not just outreach, but actually how those applications are going to be accessible to everyone. Um, and also who is uh, responsible for documenting those affirmative marketing efforts and outcomes. Um, use affirmative marketing. Um, Oh, I apologize. Use affirmative marketing requirements um, as a path to guide determinations regarding roles, outreach efforts, and processes to ensure access to all QPs. All right, and now I'm going to pass it over to Jessica, who's going to dig in a little bit on each of the methods that I just kind of went over um, and provide some examples. Great. Thanks, Andalyn. Um, that was a great overview of the foundations of what we're going to talk today about. Um, as you can tell, there are a lot of decisions about referral methods and implementation that a PJ needs to make, and those decisions really are influenced by who you intend on serving. Um, you know, the referral method really impacted by the qualifying populations generally. And then any of those specific preferences and limitations that you have in your allocation plan that you decided to do for your local level. So now we're going to explore all of the three home ARP referral methods. We're going to discuss some of those considerations that you should be thinking about. And what a particular referral method process may look like. Um, and then we'll go over some real examples for the types of referral methods. Um, so we're going to get started with the home ARP cord expanded coordinated entry. So before the household, oh, yep, okay. <laughs> before a household is referred to a home ARP project, the PJ and the Continuum of Care or COC really have to collaborate to plan and establish that operational framework for home ARP expanded coordinated entry. We've listed those on the slide, those key elements of building that, that framework. And as Andalyn outlined earlier, the practices to inform and solicit applications from all four QPs is really a key component of a compliant affirmative marketing plan. So PJs, COCs, project owners, and subrecipients really have to work together to affirmatively market home ARP projects. So when you're thinking about using home ARP expanded coordinated entry, there are some additional steps that are necessary to ensure that that requirement is met. Like Andalyn said, coordinated entry systems have to expand to serve all four QPs. So they're gonna have to also expand their marketing and outreach to the other qualifying populations that they don't typically serve. So the PJ has to decide the best way to market to all four of those QPs for the home ARP project in collaboration with those partners that Andalyn kind of talked about. The second piece is the method of prioritization and preferences that are used by the coordinated entry system. The PJ and the COC really have to agree that the coordinated entry system will only use the home ARP preferences 
and methods of prioritization that are described in the approved allocation plan. As the PJ, you may have mirrored what the coordinated entry systems method of prioritization and preferences were in your allocation plan. But if you didn't, you really want to make sure that the coordinated entry system is able to meet what you described in your approved allocation plan and that there aren't any additional preferences or methods of prioritization that occur in the referral process. Next, in cases where the coordinated entry system does not have an available referral, you really need to think about a protocol that is going to be put in place on how this is going to be communicated and where additional referrals would come from, whether through other referral methods or a project or activity specific waiting list. Next, you really want to talk with your COC and think about how the COC and the PJ's geographic boundaries may or may not match up. Sometimes they don't match up, and it's really essential to ensure that your coordinated entry system provides access and implements a uniform referral process, specifically when the project geographic area is maybe broader than what's covered by the coordinated entry system. And additionally, your coordinated entry system may require additional staffing or funding to really expand. And so that expansion will 100% have to require more training. And Home ARP really isn't the business as usual for either of the PJs or the coordinated entry system. And so working together with the continuum of care, PJs really need to decide on what is that training that's required, who's going to provide it, and what are the resources and tools that are needed? So all of these decisions have to be documented and the PJ and the COC should either execute a written agreement or an MOU or memorandum of understanding to reflect those decisions. Um, no referrals should occur prior to signing such an agreement. So as we mentioned on the previous slide, the PJ, the COC, the owners and subrecipients really have to work together on an affirmative marketing for home art projects and activities to all four of those QPs. COCs in the home ARP expanded coordinated entry could be asked to specifically outreach to QPs who they typically don't serve. Um, and so during implementation, you have to be sure to identify those outreach methods that will be used for each of the QPs, um, especially for those that are least likely to apply to a home art project or activity. You really talk through the process together, ensure that applications are accessible to all, consider what you may, you know, other agencies that you may need to consult with that have different expertise in serving some or part of a qualifying population, and then finally, identify who's going to be responsible for documenting the affirmative marketing efforts and outcomes. So, as Andalyn outlined again earlier, a referral method provides access to home ARP projects or activities to all eligible qualifying populations and connects those eligible qualifying households to a home art project or activity. So what really are the components that go into a successful referral process? Well, in this presentation, we're going to talk about each of the three referral methods, but we'll name different components of the process to share an understanding about what occurs during referral. We want to just note here that a referral method doesn't always follow a really clean linear process. It may not be sequential like it appears on these slides. You may have nuances within your system. There may be certain things that you need to really think about as you're going through this. And it could look really different when you're beginning implementation just on your local structure. But each of the components that we're going to talk about should occur prior to a household enrolling into a home art project. So the referral process as described has the following parts. You've got an opening or a vacancy. So this is um, the form of which someone is informed that there's a vacancy. How did you communicate that vacancy or that availability? Intake, um, which is inclusive of both of the receipt of referrals and the verification of qualifying population status. Then you've got prioritization, 
which is the organization of applications according to your approved preferences and methods of prioritization. And then finally, referral, which is when the applicants are sent to the project for that opening or vacancy. So we're gonna kind of take a little bit uh, look at that from the Home ARP expanded coordinated entry referral methods. So in the opening of vacancy, if you were doing coordinate expanded coordinated entry, the Home ARP project would indicate that to coordinated entry that there's an opening or vacancy in the project. The Home ARP expanded coordinated entry system has been receiving referrals from all four QPs and has been collecting that eligible documentation on an ongoing basis, that kind of dynamic list that Andalyn talked about. So coordinated entry staff you know, are verifying QP status according to those home ARP definitions during that intake process. Then for prioritization, the coordinated entry system then organizes the list of eligible households according to those preferences identified in your home allocation plan. So, for example, if you had a preference for QP1, those households in QP1 would go to the top of your list with your method of prior, your preference. Then coordinated entry staff would organize according to any methods of prioritization that you identified. So, for example, if your method of prioritization was length of time homeless, then everyone who qualified for the homeless status is ordered according to how long they've been experiencing homelessness. So your preference is putting those QP ones at the top, and then your method of prioritization is arranging those by how long someone's been experiencing homelessness. Then the next part is the referral. So coordinated entry would send the agreed upon number of applications from the top of the list along with any documentation that was gathered that demonstrates eligibility over to the project. The project then reaches out to those households in the order in which they appear on the list. They notify them of the vacancy or opening, and then they begin the process of enrollment. So we'll break it down with a specific example. So community A has a home ARP rental housing project with units that are restricted for qualifying households. This project will receive referrals through the Home ARP Expanded Coordinated Entry. The PJ and this project have a preference for seniors, those over age 62, experiencing homelessness. The method of prioritization is the chronological order of application. So prior to accepting referrals, the PJ and the COC signed that written agreement or MOU. And as we think about this referral process and those steps that we were talking about, in this example, the rental housing property manager identifies that there's a vacancy that exists, and then they notify coordinated entry staff. The intake has been ongoing, so coordinated entry staff have been receiving those applications for all four QPs. And once they receive that notice from the property owner, they then organize all those existing applications for that rental housing in accordance to the PJ's preferences. And in this example, mo moving all of those seniors who meet that QP1 criteria to the top of the list. Then those qualifying applicants are organized on the list according to the date of their application, because that was their method of prioritization. CE staff then would send that list of qualified applicants along with the documentation of their QP status to the property manager. We just want to note the property manager doesn't have to accept um, applications or referrals for the home ARP unit for, from anywhere else. They would just get it from coordinated entry if you did expanded home ARP coordinated entry. So then the property manager is going to follow the order of the list, contact those applicants, determine if they'd like to rent the unit. If there's any other additional screening for applicants, they'll start that assessment at that time. And then, you know, this one is pretty specific. We're talking about seniors experiencing homelessness. But what if the coordinated entry system didn't have enough households that met that criteria? Um, I probably wouldn't happen, but say that they didn't. Um, and so what they would need to do is remember that 
the seniors experiencing homelessness is a preference and not a limitation. So those that meet the definition are really just a priority of being served, not the only ones that can be served. So if the coordinated entry system didn't have any applicants that met that particular preference, then coordinated entry would organize applications from all four QPs, including those other QP ones in chronological order and send those applications to the property manager. So now we're going to turn to coordinated entry and other referral methods. And before I move on, I, I know that there are questions coming through the chat. We are not ignoring you. We're going to get into breakout sessions where you can meet with TA providers and ask these specific questions. So please hold on to them um, and make sure that when you go to those breakout groups, you, you raise those. Okay. Um, so, unlike the home ARP expanded coordinated entry, where all referrals come from the coordinated entry system, in this referral coordinated entry and other referral methods, you're having multiple referral sources. So, when selecting this referral method, we know that the coordinated entry system will be one of those referral sources. But as the PJ, you really need to determine in detail where are those other referrals coming from? How are they going to be used to supplement that coordinated entry system? So PJs really have to identify those agencies and ensure that they um, are collectively, all of those referral sources are providing access to all four QPs. Now that there are referrals coming from two or more sources, a PJ needs to identify how the referral sources are gonna to coordinate together, who's gonna to serve as a list administrator, meaning who's really gonna be responsible for the collection and organization of those referrals from all of the different sources, potentially in a centralized location. By organizing referrals, we really just mean organizing applications chronologically or prioritizing it based on your approved preferences and methods of prioritization. You'll also want to determine when the qualifying population documentation will be collected and by whom. So example, you could collect documentation when the application is initially made, or you could wait for the list administrator to collect them review that when there's actually an opening or a vacancy. But again, you know, these determinations really need to be thought about, thought through at the local level, and really have to be documented in your policies and procedures. You want to make sure that you're documenting in those policies and procedures the contact process. So what's the process if the activity can't reach a qualifying population household? Is there a minimum number of attempts that you're going to make over a certain amount of days? Will a project hold a spot for someone who's interested, but maybe is institutionalized or isn't immediately available for enrollment? So you really need to think through the process as you're connecting with your partners and thinking about all of the qualifying populations. Documentation of those QPs and the contact process are really important decisions and determinations for how a referral method is going to be implemented. And finally, as we mentioned earlier, PJs are really responsible for that affirmative marketing across all referral sources, including the coordinated entry and other referral methods for all of those home art projects and activities. So always remembering that you're trying to reach out to all the qualifying population, particularly those who may not typically apply for a project. So we're gonna take a look at this referral process. Again, we're going back to that kind of four part um, model that we talked about. So in the opening or vacancy, the project is gonna notify the list administrator of an opening. At intake, as we mentioned earlier, coordinated entry and other referral methods could be managed in a centralized location maybe by a 211, or it could be managed at the project or activity itself. So the intake process is going to vary depending on who's managing and organizing those applications. But regardless, somewhere there needs to be a list that's going to contain all of the applications from all of the referral sources. Those applications are received. The QP status is confirmed through that appropriate documentation. 
Now we're going to move over to prioritization where the list administrator is organizing the list. So when they move households that qualify for any of those identified preferences to the top of the list. So an example, if we had a preference for a veteran, those veterans would move to the top of the list. And then if there's a method of prioritization, we would organize the group of those preferred households according to that method of prioritization. Otherwise, the referrals are just organized in chronological order of receipt. Then we move into referral where the list administrator sends the qualifying households information and supporting documentation to the project. The project is then going to connect with those qualifying households in the order of the list until the opening or vacancy is filled. Then the project is just going to confirm that documentation of QP status is accurate. Request any additional documents that might be needed. And then for any referral rejections, they really need to communicate that both to the household that was rejected and to the list administrator. So again, we're going to do this in an example. So this is going to be community B. Community B has a home ARP rental housing project with only units restricted for occupancy for QP households. This project will receive referrals through coordinated entry and other referral methods. The PJ in this project have a limitation for those experiencing homelessness or QP1. Prior to accepting referrals, the PJ enters into that written agreement with the project owner and an MOU in this example with the COC regarding those referrals. The project owner agrees to serve as the list administrator. The project owner begins to accept referrals from coordinated entry and self-referrals from QP1 only. And remember, the project has a QP1 limitation, so it's not accepting referrals from any other qualifying population, and it's only accepting those referrals from QP1. The coordinated entry system sends referrals to the list administrator with the homeless QP eligibility documentation, and the list administrator is also receiving those QP1 referrals from households directly. The list administrator is going to organize the referrals in the order in which they've received, regardless of the referral source, meaning that none of those sources have priority over the other. Coordinated entry is given the same consideration as that self referral. The property manager then follows the order of the list, contacts those qualifying applicants to decide if they'd like to rent the unit, and then conducts a final determination of qualifying population eligibility. We have a second example here, um, and this is example community C. And this particular community is going to be administering a TBRA or tenant based rental assistance using coordinated entry and other referral methods with referrals from coordinated entry and the 211 hotline. So the PJ and the activity have a preference for the homeless QP or QP1. And the method of prioritization is the longest history of homelessness. Community C has identified that the coordinated entry system as a referral source for the homeless QP. So prior to accepting referrals, the PJ has clear policies and procedures. There's that MOU or written agreement as applicable, including the COC and the 211 hotline. And in this example, 211 hotline agrees to serve as that list administrator. This is really important that like PJs implement a strong affirmative marketing plan to ensure that you have access and outreach to the least likely to apply, especially since many of the QPs would access the project through a centralized phone line. So you're really wanting to be thoughtful about how you're going to be reaching those all four of those qualifying populations. So in this example, 211 receives QP1 referrals from coordinated entry in the order of the length of time homeless with eligibility documentation. And then 211 also receives referrals for the other QPs through the 211 hotline and 211 collects the eligibility documentation. So you've got all four of those qualifying populations having access to apply. 
All referrals are then centralized and organized first by preference. So all of those QP1 referrals go from coordinated entry, go to the top of the list. And then by method of prioritization. So all of the QP1 referrals are then organized in the order of length of time homeless. So those who've experiencing homelessness the longest to those who are experiencing it for the shortest. The TBRA project has an opening and informs 211. 211 is the list administrator pulls those top households. And if the coordinated entry system has no eligible households, the list administrator refers applicants from the other QPs in chronological order. So the TBRA pro project conducts a final determination of eligibility and then they document, um, update all of that documentation as needed. Okay, so finally we're gonna turn to a project or activity waiting list. The project or activity waiting list, if you have any experience in running home programs, is the referral method that most of you are probably familiar with. Um, when you're preparing to administer a project or activity waiting list for home art, you'll need to determine who's gonna administer the waiting list as if it was the same list being maintained for one or more projects. So like in every discussion, you need to have that affirmative marketing plan. They're really a key component for compliant projects. PJs really need to consider how they will market the project information, the eligibility criteria and applications to all four QPs. And remember who we serve in the home are program differs significantly from who we serve in the home program. So it's likely that you're going to have to really rethink your outreach and affirmative marketing strategies for all four QPs. And again, especially for those that are least likely to apply within the qualifying populations. PJs would also need to develop policies and procedures about the method and tools to be used to organize applications and the ongoing maintenance of the wait list. Things such as how often will household information be updated? What do you do if you can't reach one of the qualifying population households? And then as applicable, you'll identify the process for implementing any preferences or methods of prioritization if you established any. So we'll go back through that kind of four step process again. Prior to accepting referrals, the details of the previous slide are really consistent with documenting the appropriate written agreements and policies and procedures. So when there's an opening, the wait list will be administered at the project or activity level. So depending on where that is, the project will notify whomever's overseeing that waiting list whenever there's a vacancy or opening. For intake, the qualifying households will apply directly and or be referred by other agencies on, to the waiting list and the lead administrator will collect the documentation for QP status. For prioritization, the waitlist will be organized first by any preferences, then by any method of prioritization. And remember the default, if you didn't have a preference or method of prioritization would be in the chronological order of application. And then finally with referral, the project would connect the person on the waiting list in the order of the list until the opening or vacancy is filled. And then the project confirms eligibility, updating that documentation as needed. And we'll do another example here. We've got Community D. They funded three supportive service projects that offer short-term rental assistance. They've elected to use an activity specific waiting list and the PJ and the Supportive Services Activity establish a preference for veterans across all four QPs. So in this example, veterans, regardless of that QP status, will be prioritized over other applicants without a veteran status, meaning their method of prioritization then is going to be the chronological order of application. So the PJ itself agrees to serve as that lead administrator for the activity specific waiting list. And as the lead administrator, they receive all referrals and collect the eligibility documentation along with the applications. The lead administrator then organizes the list by veteran status. So veterans are moved to the top of the list regardless of QP 
in the order of their date of application. The remaining applications are listed chronologically. One of the supportive projects notifies the PJ that they have room on their caseload for an additional household. So the PJ as the lead administrator then sends the information and documentation for those QP households from the top of the list over to that project. And the project confirms eligibility and then updates documentation as needed. Okay, so home art referral methods must be used for compliant home art projects and activities. How long they must be used really depends on the activity type, as Andalyn mentioned earlier. Home art referral methods must be used throughout the compliance period for rental housing projects and through the restricted use period for non congregate shelter, and then throughout the written agreement period for supportive services and tenant based rental assistance. Overall, your policies and procedures for referral methods need to include access for all four QPs, ensuring that all eligible individuals have access and that affirmative marketing efforts align with this requirement. Two, that they have a prioritization alignment. Referrals should be made in accordance to those preferences, methods of prioritizations and limitations that are outlined in your approved allocation plan. And finally, it must have clear roles and responsibilities, defining who's responsible for each step of the referral process to ensure accountability. All of those concepts should also be integrated into written agreements or MOUs. And again, you know, we keep talking about this over and over and over, but how participants access projects is a crucial factor in who is ultimately being served and benefiting from the home art program. So be intentional, and be mindful while you're just designing those referral methods and developing affirmative marketing plans to ensure that there's equitable access to home ARP projects and activities. So we talked a lot today. Um, there are a lot of resources on the HUD exchange about home our referral methods. We encourage you to check those out. Um, and we'll make sure that, you know, you have access to these um, links as well. When you get into your breakout groups, we can share those with you. Um, and I think we can go to the next slide. And that really concludes our presentation. And I'm going to turn it over to Sean.